Okay, welcome to the recording for cells for AP Bio. Walk through some of the basics of uh, this chapter to help you get a better understanding of relationship among cells, differences, and the major organ nails that are found inside the cells, their functions, and then we'll finish off with how cells can adhere to each other, so the cell surface junctions. All right, so first piece here is the connection between uh, the prokaryotic cells and the eukaryotic cells. So what I have here is a slide that is showing the uh, phylogenetics connection between the three major domains. So you can see there's bacteria, archaea, and eukarya. Um, these are the three major domains in the understanding that we have with current technology to uh, classify the different types of cells in the world. So you know bacteria, uh, bacteria being a prokaryotic cell. The one that we haven't talked about is archaea. So archaea is bacteria that are more in the extreme of files. So right? when we say files loving, right, they love the extreme. So you can kind of see based on these names here, sulfobus, sulfobus is loving the sulfur areas. Pyro loves the heat. And then methane, um, and these are just, the back half here is just talking about the shapes of those bacteria. So we have bacteria and archaea, which are closely related, you can see here on the branch. But then the archaea are much more similar to the group eukarya, which is where the eukaryotes are. So these are prokaryotes, the archaea, archaea and the bacteria one, but the archaea are more related to the eukaryas than the bacteria are related to the eukaryas. So a little tie-in to some of the stuff that we're talking about with making trees and whatnot. Okay, so that's a general background. So let's talk a little bit about the differences and similarities between prokaryotes and eukaryotes. So here's a basic diagram showing you a prokaryotic cell and a eukaryotic cell. You have to know the things that they have in common and what you could find or what you cannot find in both of these types of cells. So this slide is really nice. It explains or shows the things in common. So plasma membrane, cell membrane, cytoplasm, the space and watery fluid that encompasses the inside of the cell. They should have DNA or RNA. Uh, a nucleoid region is just the cluster of where all that DNA is in the prokaryotic cell. Whereas in a eukaryotic cell, it's all housed in a nucleus. So that's not something in common. It's just talking about where that DNA is stored. And then these organelles we call ribosomes. Now these are not membrane bound organelles, but they are required in order to make proteins, which we will talk about more. Uh, notice that these have a defined shape. There's some little cilia and flagella here. Um, so some of the things that we see in eukaryotic cells, we do see in prokaryotic cells, but we can't say it's in every cell type of deal. Uh, prokaryotic cells generally have a cell wall. It's just not made the same way that plant cells or fungus cells are made. Um, a common thing is called petitoglycan, which is a protein sugar-based cell wall. Whereas in a plant cell, it's cellulose. It's all the carbohydrate-based polysaccharide. So just keep that kind of stuff in perspective. Um, you can see size is different as well, bacteria being very, very tiny, using uh, electron microscopes generally to see uh, more detail about the prokaryotic cells just because they're that small, whereas we can use a light microscope to see the eukaryotic cells in, in most cases. All right, <clears throat> let's continue on. So we're going to talk about the eukaryotic cell that is an animal-based cell first. So we're going to kind of walk through the different organelles, their functions, and uh, we'll move on to the plant cells after that. So nucleus, key thing for the nucleus is obviously to store the DNA on the inside of the cell. Right, so we want to keep DNA in here because that's the hard copy to make our protein. So if we accidentally destroy the blueprint, well, then there's no way that we can, if we're going to make an analogy, build more houses. Uh, if you take a copy to the work site, like RNA, and that accidentally gets destroyed, well, you can make more copies. But if you accidentally draw, draw the, destroy the original, the blueprint, then you're in trouble. So DNA needs to be stored in here. Then you have the nucleolus, which you can't see because it's recording things here. The nucleolus, and that nucleolus is just made. That nucleolus uh, is the center for making the ribosome. So this is going to be putting together the rRNA 
and the ribosomal proteins that we need in order to make the ribosome. So that's the factory of ribosome making. And then the rest of the nucleus stores that DNA. Now remember, DNA uh, works together with histones to make chromatin. Right? That's what this is. So chromatin is a DNA protein complex. The specific protein is histone. And we'll talk later on about how that uh, DNA and protein complex winds together in order to make uh, the chromosomes that we see in mitosis. So, next piece is our plasma membrane, right? All cells have that. That's more like a barrier. We'll talk about how things move in and out of there. Here we have the endoplasmic reticulum, or ER for short. Remember, there's two types of ER, rough ER and smooth ER. Rough ER has these ribosomes on it. That's why it's considered rough. And those ribosomes, as we had just said, make proteins. So the proteins that they make, especially rough ER, are going to be used and transported through the endomembrane system to be secreted out of the cell, whereas the ribosomes that are free-floating, like out here, are going to be used solely for this specific cell that we're looking at. Smooth ER, on the other hand, makes lipids, right? Carbohydrate-based and uh, just regular lipids as well. And they're going to be, uh, if we're using the endomembrane system, then we're going to be using those to actually make the membrane for that specific cell. All right? So that's ER. Flagella, uh, microtubules, microfilaments to propel the cell, move it around. Uh, cytoskeleton, right? We talked about the microfilaments, intermediate filaments, microtubules. Uh, cell support. And then they could obviously, as it's showing here, function in cilia and flagella. Uh, Golgi apparatus down here uh, is used for modification. So when we're doing the endomembrane system, we make a protein. So the code comes from DNA to RNA. We transport it out. It starts making the protein. The protein then travels through the ER, buds off in a vesicle to the Golgi. The Golgi is modified by adding lipids and carbohydrates as tags, and then buds off a final vessel, and it pops out to the cell membrane, pushed out of the cell for excretion. Okay. Uh, the Golgi is that modifier. So it can modify any products that we're making inside the cell for either internal use or expelling. Uh, what you can't see here is the lysosome and the peroxisomes. So the lysosome is a little vacuole kind of that has hydrolytic enzymes in it. Uh, we can use this for autophagy, which is the destruction of old organelles. We can also use it to destroy things that maybe a cell would bring in, like a white blood cell. If a white blood cell did phagocytosis, uh, the bacteria that it takes in would then bind with the lysosome, and we would destroy that bacteria. And we'll come back to that with the immune system. Peroxisomes are an organelle right here that's full of hydrogen peroxide. Hydrogen peroxide is good for detoxifying compounds. It can transfer uh, different, the, the H pluses or the protons from toxins and pick up and react and make a less toxic material that our body can handle. And uh, finally in this here we have the ribosomes, or the ribosomes, the mitochondria. Uh, mitochondria we're going to talk about a heck of a lot uh, throughout the year. They're very unique. They look almost like a bacteria would look out in the wild in that uh, the extra foldings to allow for different reactions to occur. And the really cool part, and we'll talk about this near the end of this uh, recording, is that they have their own DNA. So there's not only DNA inside your nucleus, but you have mitochondrial DNA as well. So these things can divide inside your body without the control of your nucleus. Uh, they also are the site for ATP production. Uh, last piece then, sorry, I forgot about this, is centrosomes or centrioles uh, found in only animal cells. And those centrioles are used for making spindle fibers, microtubules for when we do a mitotic process, we divide, or meiosis, we divide. All right, plant cell, unique things in the plant cells that are a little different. Obviously, you could have a cell wall around the outside, and that's for support, made out of cellulose. A lot of the other ones are the same in here. Uh, the only things that are big time different is the fact that they have chloroplasts. The chloroplasts are like photosynthetic bacteria that are living inside the cells because they also have their own DNA. So the chloroplasts can divide inside the cells without the control of the nucleus DNA inside that plant cell. So they're 
like their own extra working units and they symbi symbiotically work with the rest of the cell. And we'll come back to that. It's the endosymbiosis theory. Vacuole, so large central vacuole as well, inside of a plant cell, stores water. It takes up a majority of the space inside the plant cell, so less cytoplasmic contents because of that large vacuole. You see that they do have lys or peroxisomes as well, but no lysosomes. Uh, plant cells do not contain lysosomes, so that's a unique thing that's found just in the animal cells. All right, we'll come back to these little ports here in a second when we do the cellular uh, surface pieces or the junction pieces. All right, endosymbiosis theory. I told you we were going to talk about it. Here it is right now. Endosymbiosis theory uh, is this process. If we look at uh, the fossil record, the first cells that we see in the fossil record are all prokaryotic cells, right? So just like we talked about, there's DNA contents, cell membranes, ribosomes, cell cytoplasmic contents. And then as we continue on, we start seeing some cells uh, folding in their membranes. And anytime you see extra foldings, that's a surface area to volume ratio kind of fix, right? So the more folding, the more surface that we have, the more reactions, the more diffusion, the more osmosis, a lot of different things can happen just because we have more folding. As you see, we're starting to develop an area where the DNA is being kind of collected. Finally, we get a nucleal nucleus starting to form, an endoplasmic reticulum. So now we're starting to see the beginnings of a eukaryotic cell. And then we start seeing uh, in the fossil record the first cells that start having mitochondria. Well, there are bacteria that are in the world that look a heck of a lot like mitochondria and function the same way a mitochondria does. But these are obviously engulfed in. We start getting a symbiotic relationship. So we start really developing the first ancestral heterotrophic eukaryotic cell. Remember, heterotrophic means that they uh, have to consume food in order to make their ATP. They cannot make their own food sources. We also see cells that start engulfing and taking in the chloroplast. Remember, chloroplast mitochondria having their own DNA, they can replicate. Uh, and in turn, we get these chloroplasts that start doing the photosynthesis part. Plants also have mitochondria as well. So all this is supported by data, uh, fossil records. There's lots of different things that support this and make this a very, very strong theory. All right, let's talk about cytoskeleton. So cytoskeleton, we have that framework piece inside the cell. So this is a nice little cross cut of a cell where you can see the mitochondria, you can see the ER, and then all these green and blue things are the cytoskeleton components. So they support the cell. Think of it as a structural internal framework. Uh, that's why it's called cytoskeleton, because uh, it's cytoplasmic support. Uh, and then, obviously, we can push that out, cellular push-outs that end up turning into, if we push it out and start making little fingers on the outside, it could be cilia, or if we make a long whip tail, it could be a flagella, okay? All right, cell surface junctions for the last piece here. Uh, three main ones that you have to know. Actually, I should say four. Uh, the tight junctions are ones where we're not really, it glues the cells together but it doesn't allow things to pass through. We have the desmosomes here, which are like little fingers that are reaching into the cells and anchoring them together. And then the last one is the communication one. So here we have like a cytoplasmic continuation where things can be passed from one cell to the next. So in a plant cell, we call those plasmodesmata. And in animal cells, it's pretty much the same thing, a cytoplasmic continuation called a gap junction. And with that, we have pretty much concluded all the major basic stuff for the cells unit and the organelles. Uh, please see the recording for osmosis if you need help with uh, any of the cellular movement components of this unit. Thanks.